And as promised here on Brookline Interactive Group, we've got my friend and yours, Jeff Speck. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tommy. It's it's uh, so nice to talk to you. It's not as not doesn't happen as often as I would like. Now, now listen. A lot of the folks on on the show are elected or uh, otherwise sort of uh, in the front of people's minds, and you've been working in the background. So, who the heck are you, and what have you been up to for the last? <laughs> You know, 60 odd years. Yeah, uh, almost 60 years, but I haven't been working that whole time. <laughs> um, I'm a city planner. I'm based in Brookline. I grew up in Belmont uh, and uh, left this fair state for my first real gig in my profession at age 30, um, where I spent uh, 10 years in Miami with the folks that inspired me, which was um, kind of the, the the foundational new urbanists. So when I was in, in college and then later on, I learned about the work of these folks who had basically um, realized that we've been planning America wrong for about 50 years, um, led by Andre Stwani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, um, who eventually teamed up with a bunch of other people to create this whole new, ur new urbanism movement around uh, alternatives to suburban sprawl, around reinvesting in our city centers, um, and, um, uh, you know, essentially getting us back and hopefully beyond uh, the quality of design that we were looking at in our communities a century ago. Um, so I uh, was trained as an architect uh, and uh, thought I'd become an architect. But when I saw the work of these folks um, back in the 80s, I was like, wow, you know, design can have uh, such a, uh, a greater impact on society and on the quality of life. And if we um, if we design better places, we can save lives and we can have more productive lives. And so um, I spent a decade in Miami with my mentors and then actually was appointed to the National Endowment for the Arts um, uh, in 2003, where I served four years as design director. Subsequent to that, I started my own firm. So from 2007 on, first in Washington, D.C., and then starting eight years ago here in Brookline, um, I've, I've had my small firm called Speck and Associates, where I do projects for um, cities. I do downtown master plans. I do waterfront studies. I do urban infill plans. Uh, I also do projects for developers, um, mostly or almost entirely new town work. So it has to be mixed use, walkable, uh, not auto centric uh, development. Um, and while doing all of this, I took good notes. <laughs> so um, uh, the other part of my career has been writing about about urban design. So I was so inspired by Andre Stwani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg that I wrote a book with them um, or convinced them to let me write a book for them and then with them um, that came out in 2000 called Suburban Nation. And Suburban Nation was probably the best selling planning book of that decade. And it basically told this story about, you know, why we love older places, why we love traditional neighborhoods, why we love villages, towns, cities, and why we hate sprawl, and how sprawl is actually the only thing that's legal. And if we want to build more um, great places, we need to change the laws. And of course, that's been a huge part of our work. Um, and then um, in 2012, my own book, Walkable City, came out. And Walkable City was um, a reaction to the last decade that I'd spent working largely with mayors. Um, in downtowns, trying to make downtowns more viable. You, uh, on your prompt, I've put my books in front of me. So here's Walkable City. You'll notice the subtitle is How Downtown Can Save America One Step at a Time. And that is the uh, idea of the book. And that was the best-selling book of its decade in, in planning. Um, and I have a follow-up, and I only mention it for your audience, because this is the book that cities use, that people in cities use to convince other people to care about making their cities more walkable and more livable and to do a better job of it. But it's it's really kind of like a gateway drug for people who who want to get excited about this stuff or actually are excited about it, but don't don't know that much about it or want to teach other people about how our cities can be better planned. But if you're actually doing the work, I came out a couple of years ago with this follow up book called Walkable City Rules. Um, we had a wonderful uh, reading party in the Brookline Booksmith when that came out uh, a couple of years ago. And this is a book actually um, filled with details, techniques, diagrams, photographs, and actually it's 101 rules. And each rule 
uh, is carefully you know illustrated and described. Like, don't have sharrows. Sharrows actually are more dangerous than um, than nothing at all in your in your you know as a bicycle marking. So it's full of details like that. So that's that's my whole story. Sorry it took so long, but basically doing city planning, writing about city planning, um, working with developers and mayors, uh, and of course city councilors and others, including some folks in state houses. Um, I've Early on, I was able to help the uh, folks in, in Pennsylvania um, write ordinances that allowed for mixed use development, for example. You know, so there are some states that have been uh, active in, in doing what they can, you know, state representatives who are doing what they can to at least create a enabling framework for better design in individual communities. And, and we know Pennsylvania needs all the help they can get. <laughs> um, I got so many questions and so many ways we can go with it. But one one thing that um, I think Brookline is grappling with, and other communities, you know, Boston um, and 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 surrounding communities in this metro area and other metro areas, uh, there's a tension I think in urbanism, and it relates to a couple of different things you said. Um, you know, you point out that we love downtown areas, we love walkable areas. There's people that's just they're the places we want to be. Um, and and you mentioned I won't I don't have the I don't remember the exact words but sort of there's a there's not just a convenience to it there's an aesthetic beauty to it and uh, there's no question that uh, that's true and that there's this human scale to downtown areas where the buildings aren't you know 300 yards long right they tend to be smaller and there's uh, the facades are mixing it up and it keeps it interesting. Uh, and I think all of that's true. And I also think that um, urban areas are just really convenient for modern living, right? Even, regardless of the aesthetic of it, like that I can flip my son a $20 bill and he can walk to couples and get a dozen bagels on a Saturday or Sunday morning is really solid because he's 11, right? And, and we uh, do that. We just send our 13-year-old to Mamala's. Yeah. So they, 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 they pass as they walk by each other. Um, <laughs> But modern construction, um, many people don't find as beautiful as 100-year-old buildings. And, and whether or not they're right doesn't matter. Uh, how, do we, how do we work through the tension of reinvigorating downtown areas with modern construction when, at least for some folks, what they love about it isn't going to be replicated? Well, a lot of the work that I've done um, has been to try to um, uh, accept but work with modern large infusions of capital and yet somehow have an outcome which doesn't feel like that. So it's the reality, it's the reality of development practice in the U.S. Um, and I work with some of these firms. I work with an with, with a, uh, $8 billion um, investment company that's building, you know, hundred millions of dollars here and there and everywhere all around the U.S. Um, uh, the fact is that most real estate development is happening with these very large infusions of capital. So we've we've worked very hard over the years to try to create uh, a framework that produces places that have variety, that have um, you know authenticity. Actually, is uh, I define often loosely, I guess, define authenticity as as variety within unity. So if you think about all the places that you love to visit, particularly globally. Um, they feel authentic because actually there was a certain shared vocabulary. There was a certain common understanding based on climate, based on building materials, based on tradition um, that was inherited, but then lots of hands at work, right? And that feeling of energy of, 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 of humanness that comes from having many different authors, but within a shared uh, vocabulary or tradition, um, that creates an authentic place. And so just to give one little example, um, <clears throat> I worked on Riverside. So Riverside, we're, we're turning a um, thousand car, 10 acre parking lot at the end of the Green Line into a million plus square foot mixed use development. Um, it's for Mark development. I was the city planner. I'm still very involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and um, uh, not, only, not only did I do the land plan, but with my, with my colleagues, we created what's called a demise line diagram. And a demise line diagram takes these longer buildings because if you're selling... 600, if you're renting 650 units of housing, you know, those are going to be bigger buildings. 
it takes those buildings and actually artificially um, divides them up into um, what appears to be multiple buildings. And then we assign those facades to different architects, either in different firms, and there are a number of different architecture firms working at Riverside, or we ask the architects in their own firms to hand out the individual facades to different studios within their firms. And so you create this fiction, and it's a lie, which is what I was taught not to do in architecture school. But sometimes I say it's like a white lie. It's what you have to, you know, sometimes you lie to make someone feel better, <laughs> right? So here we've created a technique that allows these very large buildings to actually look and feel like smaller buildings. If you go to assembly row on that main square that looks out to the, um, to the water, you'll see that technique at work. Elkis Manfredi did that job. And there's a building right there that looks like three buildings. Um, so you use techniques like that. Obviously the, the ideal, is to not just break down the, the chunk of building, but to break down the chunk of investment and to create a code which is friendlier to smaller incremental developers. But unfortunately, these days, there aren't that many folks trying to develop buildings from that perspective compared to um, you know, these large companies that are able to build uh, big projects at once. Now, in, in places like Brookline and, and in Boston, uh, we have some amount of mass transit of, of public transit, right? Folks can argue about whether or not it's good. It's all relative to, to experiences elsewhere, I suppose, uh, but we certainly have it. And uh, we have a tension going back, uh, probably, I guess, from the 50s and 60s, when urban renewal meant tear down buildings and build parking lots in their space, uh, where there are now sort of gaps in the fabric. And, I, and I'll give you a couple examples. I'll give you an old example and a new example, both in Coolidge Corner. The old example is the Center Street parking lot. That hasn't been a parking lot forever, right? 70 years ago, those were buildings and we ripped them down to create parking. A more, a more recent example is roughly right across from the Florida Ruff and Ridley School is an imaging center. It's like a, you, know, you get CAT scans or something. And they have this parking lot out front Right, right along Harvard Street. It actually was originally built as a restaurant. And in both cases, um, it's a lousy place to walk by, but it allows people to get to the urban center to shop. And so how do we work through uh, parking either on street or in this case, really I'd like to talk about off street parking where we have choices on what could be in that land. Uh, how do we figure out what ought to be there? So you've brought up two really good examples to compare and contrast. Um, I would say one of them does the job well and one of them does, does it poorly. <clears throat> when you consolidate parking in one space within a downtown, it becomes an anchor. It becomes a receiver and a disgorger of pedestrians. So actually in a driving community in which a lot of people get around in cars, not that we should encourage that, but in those sort of communities, um, those can contribute to the vitality of a downtown if they're hidden, if they're off the street, if they're behind the buildings, right? And while Center Street is no delight to walk on, um, it was never that significant of a pedestrian access. Everyone's walking on um, Harvard Street, which is fully protected by the fronts, or I should say fully energized and shaped and enlivened by the fronts of the buildings that give their doors directly to the sidewalk. And it's a wonderful walk until you get to that imaging center. <laughs> and I was, I gave a lecture in Princeton uh, a few weeks ago and they have this circumstance. Every downtown has it, uh, not every downtown, but most traditional downtowns have this experience. I remember just not that long ago, I was in Rhinebeck, New York, same thing, beautiful main street. And the imaging center isn't that bad, but you're walking down that main street. You're feeling just so great and, and, uh, um, you know, happy to walk. And then at a certain point in history, uh, when it was thought to be good and the codes didn't stop it, someone plunked a parking lot in front of a building. And that parking lot in front of the building does so many things that are bad. You know, it, it destroys the spatial definition of the street. And actually we like our streets to be what we call outdoor living rooms. We don't feel comfortable. Evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, humans included, were simultaneously seeking prospect and refuge. Prospect means you can see your predators before they get you, and refuge means that your flanks are covered from attack. And if your flanks don't feel covered, you actually don't feel comfortable. So when the building pulls back and it's one story tall and you lose that spatial definition behind the parking lot, um, it's no longer a comfortable space. 
Secondarily, of course, you've got the curb cut across the sidewalk. So the sidewalk is violated. It's actually a little dangerous because people may drive across it. And that's not a good thing. And then, of course, there's also the message that this, this facility is not for locals. It's for people who are coming from any distance uh, and driving in their cars um, because it's been oriented around that longer distance driving commute. So there's so many things that, 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 um, that these spaces do that are negative, but it's remarkable how town after town has them. And it's basically where you stop and turn around and don't want to keep walking. Yeah, and in this case, it's it's frankly why JFK Crossing as a commercial area struggles, because when you're walking north on Harvard, if you're on the right side of the street, you get to FRR, a playground and a school, which is lovely. But if you're strolling for shopping, it's sort of the signal to turn around. And in fact, past that is some brownstone houses with very, very little commercial activity for a couple of blocks. On the other side of the street is um, housing, not mixed use, uh, a religious institution, and then this, this imaging center, and it sends the same signal. So you get to um, the smoothie place on the left side of the street, or the restaurant on the right side of the street, and you just turn around and you come back. Yeah. Um, and and I guess it's good to hear that that's true in other places too. I mean, not good, but you know, reassuring that we're not the and, only thing And, and you started to talk about the tea. I mean, um... You know, I work in Utah, I work in Oklahoma City, I work in, um, you know, all over. Um, and people in Boston don't know how amazing <laughs> the tea is. I mean, it has its frustrations, but, but um, you know, it, it grew up around a city that was, that had such good bones to begin with, of course, as any of our cities prior to, to 1900 did. Um, and then, it is so, you know, particularly the, the rail aspect of the T is so comprehensive in terms of the neighborhoods that it touches that it really allows Boston to be one of very few, very few cities in America where we can make, and by Boston, I mean the Boston area, where we can make the choice to, to not own a car or to own fewer cars or to just not be dependent on the car as a prosthetic device to, to satisfy our daily needs. Ah, the need, the need versus want, which I know you hear all the time, right? One person's need is is another person. You, you need you need to drive. Well, maybe, maybe you don't. No, need I mean, I, I think I think um, in, in, in entirely depends on where you live. Where I live in Brookline, right. you know, on Beacon Street, looking out my window at the the beautiful fall leaves above the 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 sea line track. Um, there's no reason why I need to have a car. You know, I'm, I've, uh, uh, my wife needs one for her business and we actually enjoy having one as a luxury and I'm not going to apologize or maybe I should apologize. I'm, I am sorry um, about my footprint in that regard, I guess, but it's a choice I've made, a selfish choice. Um, we have a um, better life. We can afford a car and we have one, but we certainly don't need one. Uh, I want to change gears a little bit and think through with you um, how COVID impacts land use in urban areas. And I, I kind of don't want to talk about how it's impacting us right now. We can look around and see, hey, uh, merchants finally said, please put something else in front of my storefront other than a parallel parking spot, as long as it's for my business, right? And we said, okay, we'll do that, right? And we took, we took public space that we allow individuals to privatize and we let the business privatize it. But it serves a general public good. And, and you know, during COVID, uh, we're thinking that's a, a good exchange, but what? How do you think um, urban areas are different in, say, 2025, because of what we've learned in the last 18 months, and hopefully not too many more months to come? Well, I mean, you you use the key word, which is learned. I think some cities are learning from COVID and other uh, from their COVID experience, and others not as much. Um, you know, we saw some really interesting things happen with COVID. We saw, um, you know, and this is something I'll be talking about in December when I have a keynote address to the state DOT. Um, you know, state DOTs all over America argue, I'm, I'm helping people fight a highway in Houston. <clears throat> they argue that when you reduce congestion, you make highways safer or, and you make communities safer. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we learned from COVID 
was that when congestion went down on our streets, um, fatalities went up, I think, what, 20% per driver? <laughs> and now 2021, 2020 was like one of the worst years on record and 2021 is doing worse than that. Um, so one thing we learned is that, um, is that reducing congestion is not a solution. Speeding people up is not a suggestion to making streets safer. <laughs> That's one thing we learned. Um, as, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of communities and not just not just in, in Boston and not just in Massachusetts, a lot of communities took advantage of that reduced traffic demand to dedicate parts of their roads to other uses. And some communities, particularly in Europe, um, were very straightforward about saying, you know, we're doing this for COVID, but actually climate change is the real crisis and we need to transform our cities. We need to take advantage of this, this breather to transform our cities in order to make them uh, green, green New Deal cities, if you want to call it that. I'm very curious to see um, uh, how far Michelle Wu is able or willing to push that concept um, of what it means to be a green, a green city. Anne Hidalgo, famously in Paris, and also uh, Sadiq Khan in London, two mayors, um, really transformed their streetscapes. And in Paris, Anne Hidalgo is removing you know, half the parking spaces in the city. She's transforming hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers of streets into bikeways. Um, and uh, COVID was the trigger that allowed that to happen. Here in the US, you see a lot of streets that were, that were closed, AKA open to pedestrians and uh, other uses. Um, many cities are opening those back up to cars. Um, but in other places like Barcelona, you have the super block system where in, in every nine block grid, They've taken the two streets through the middle, imagine a tic-tac-toe board, um, and made those um, low volume, non-through streets. So different cities around the world are more or less aggressive about this. I think something as simple as um, you know, sidewalk dining in a parklet, which I've been working with cities to do for decades now. Um, you know, I put the first parklets in Cedar Rapids, Iowa <laughs> 10 years ago. And um, uh, you know, there's no reason, the only reason to get rid of those is actually to encourage more driving um, by making the lanes you know, more ample. Um, I, think, I think if there's one thing I could communicate to your audience, if they haven't heard it yet, is that the evidence is absolutely clear that congestion is, is a constant, that there will be certain moments, times of day, and of course, pandemics and other things that cause our streets to not be crowded, but it is the equilibrium condition in any developed, busy, successful area to have exactly as much traffic as people are willing to put up with. Because the principal cost of driving to us, the principal cost we pay for driving is sitting in traffic. Therefore, as you provide more lanes, more people come, as you provide fewer lanes, few, fewer people come, or they find other ways to get around like transit or cycling, um, we can have the kind of streets we want and have no more congestion. The congestion will ultimately find its level, which is exactly how much people are willing to tolerate at rush hour. And that's why these changes during COVID to remove it like we did in Coolidge Corner, to turn a lane of driving into the parking lane and then turn the parking lane into a broader sidewalk, for example. Um, those are sort of things that, that I've been helping cities to do uh, for decades now, but not just for COVID, but permanently. And they realize that it, it helps businesses. It doesn't hurt businesses to have uh, fewer lanes of through traffic. And, and the, the, the final point I want to make getting back to the Green New Deal is that you, know, you can't truly be a Green New Deal city or even a you know, Kyoto Accord city without saying we need to limit the amount of driving. And that's at the official level, you know, at, the, at the mayoral level, that's something that Marty Walsh was willing to say. It's something I know that, that um, Michelle is, is going to say that we have to limit the number of driving trips and get them onto other modes, into bikes and to, and to buses and, and trains. The problem is that most city departments of transportation, including Boston's, are operating under the expectation that you cannot reduce the throughput of any major intersection. That's just a given. And how do I know it's a given? Because you have to do a traffic study before you do any development. And if, you, if your traffic study says that it's going to go from level D to level F or whatever, um, then the project is dead. So this idea that traffic studies, that are always wrong, by the way, but the idea that traffic studies uh, are driving development means that you're not a green city. 
And so I think one of the first things Michelle Wu needs to do, and I'll tell her myself, <laughs> is um, eliminate the traffic study as a tool uh, for influencing development choices. Lots to think about. Uh, only, only unfortunately, a few minutes for us to think about it. Um, hold your books up again. I want folks to, to know about them. And I know you've been reading another book, which I want you to hold up too. Uh, um, so with your, the other with book, your third I, hand. The other book I wanted to mention to you is this book I'm reading right now by a friend of mine, Chuck Marone, called Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. And this book is brand new. It's selling better than mine right now, but I still love it. Um, and I'm actually, one of, I'm actually the first blurb. And here's what I wrote. I've been waiting for this book for a long time. It's been more than a decade since its title essay rocked me to my core. Reading it was my Meg Ryan when Harry met Sally moment. <laughs> Over the intervening years, Chuck's message has become all the more necessary and America may finally be ready for it. Chuck is an engineer. He realized that for a decade of his life, he was making communities more dangerous, um, killing people really, um, by imposing standard engineering criteria. Um, the highway, the, sorry, the, the street design profession in the U.S. grew out of the highway design profession with this presumption that a, a forgiving street is a safe street, that you remove friction, that you remove opportunities for collision, such as two-way traffic, such as cross streets, such as parallel parking, such as narrow lanes, such as um, trees, Right in, in Virginia, they call trees FHOs, fixed hazardous objects. So that concept, which is accurate for highways, which does make highways safer because the speed is set typically by people see the speed limit sign and then they set their cruise control 10 miles an hour over it. That's how the speed is set. In communities like ours, the speed at which people are driving is entirely a function of the cues that the environment is sending to the driver. Environment impacts behavior. And for that reason, we, we, not me, but we as a nation have been building roads for 50, 60 years to, with maximum forgiveness that creates the high speeds that kills pedestrians, kills drivers. Um, and you know the vision thing, the vision zero thing that you see having great success in Europe will not have success here until we accept this and we push through the natural conclusion from these arguments, which is we need to start building streets, which are currently illegal, with narrower lanes, with, with tighter conditions, to set the design speed based on how fast you want people going in your community. Like, we don't want them going more than 20 through Coolidge Corner. So why can't we design a street that causes people to go 20, as opposed to the current rule, which is called the 85th percentile rule, which is you look at how fast people are going, and you have to set the speed limit at a number in which 15% are speeding. <laughs> it's insane. So the basic message of this book, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, for those of you who really care about this space, um, is we need to fundamentally, fundamentally change the way we design streets in the US, and it's absolutely true. Jeff, thanks for taking the time to be with us here on Brookline Interactive Group. Uh, I know you're so busy, but delighted that you could spend even a few minutes with us. and. Uh, Best of luck traveling around and helping folks figure out that everything old should be new again. Thanks for letting me uh, vent. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye, Tom.